Well, welcome, David, to the Flower Podcast. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> I, our mutual friend, David, said you have to talk to Scott. So here I am. <laughs> Well, I appreciated him. I know I met him a few times when he was in Nashville and um and I, I just he's he's one of your great cheerleaders and I uh like Holly Chapel. I know she's, you know, encouraged me several times and I just of course seeing your work, I mean it goes without saying, you're we're we're, we're grateful and thrilled to have you on our podcast and It's my my pleasure. My pleasure. And I, um, I, you know, I always like to start at the beginning and a lot of people, it's a very good place to start. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> and a lot of people, a <laughs> I think so. A lot of people kind of begin, um, this kind of journey with some, some influence from their family with flowers or plants or things like that. But because of what you do in weddings and events, I feel like your journey had a much more colorful beginning. Well, it actually had quite a, an expected beginning. My uh, mother was artsy craftsy. My dad was in hotel restaurant. He worked for the Cisco Corporation for 35, 40 years. Uh, doing food. So I would ride with him all summer long and go into restaurants and hotels. So I had that institutional knowledge. Hmm. And then my godfather, who lived right next door, was a, a, a top FTD florist. And he decorated the White House. And, and I worked for him uh, from delivery right on up to making corsages. And, you know, I that's where I I got flowers in my fingers mm. and learned all the basics. Uh, you know, I can wire a corsage. There's nobody <laughs> wiring a corsage these days. It's the and, truth. You know, I'm like, give me the damn wire over here. <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> um, it was a wonderful uh, base to my learning and to, and grew up with my grandmother growing uh, flowers in her garden. And then, uh, I have three degrees in music. I don't know if you know that, but music and musical theater. Uh, so I, my theatrical background really kicked in. I worked for five years at San Diego opera in San Diego and wow. learned grand opera and learned scale and learned, um, how to wow. You know, because if you're gonna if you're gonna sit through three hours of opera, you really kind of <laughs> need to be wild at some point. There needs to be some wild. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and you know, with with the theater degree, but but mainly in opera, I learned lighting and just how important lighting is to an event. You know, uh, and I, I I'm already gonna go down the route telling stories. You know, I can have a a dad in here going. I don't need lighting. That ballroom has lighting. And I'm like, yeah, I, you're not, I'm not going to allow you to invest all the money in flowers that you have here and not be able to see them correctly. Yeah. So uh, he was like, yeah, I don't think we need them. So I, we have uh, in our sample room, we have professional lighting uh, pin spots and Legos and stuff just to create the mood of the room. And so you can tell the actual color that you'll be seeing in the room. Uh, so I walked over and just jerked the cord out of the wall and said, now, what do you think? <laughs> and, and what happened? And, um, he wrote the check for the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it is such a true statement. I mean, I know I've been involved with um, like exhibitions at conventions and things like that and people who don't want to pay the money for lighting and you have that those gigantic fixtures that are what 30 feet in the air I don't even know and yeah. it's it's just not I mean it makes such a difference and and I, and that's I love that dramatic way just yanking the plug out of the wall <laughs> yeah well it, it, it why spend all the money on flowers if you can't see them and and that people aren't going to go, oh, wow, when they walk into the room. Yeah. Actually, uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about at AI AIFD this year uh, at their convention on July 3rd. 
It's oh, special. how wonderful. I didn't know yeah. you were going to be speaking there. That's incredible. Yeah. I, I, it's such an honor that, I, you know, I'm just like, do you know who I am that I, I can't tell you all the Latin names of a flower? I, you know, but they were like, no, you're, you're doing events. We want you to do it. So I'm going to be talking about spectacle and creating mm. spectacle. So that I, I'm very excited about that. That's amazing. So, so you, how did you get to New York? Um, Ian Campbell, who was the artistic director of San Diego Opera, pulled me in. I, I had been doing a little television. I was uh, an administrator with them. I was singing and I was really involved in the arts in San Diego. And he pulled me in his office one day and said, do you realize you've hit a glass ceiling here? You're not going to advance the way you need to. You need to get out of this town. And I had an agent at the time and she said, well, if you're gonna go into television, you're gonna have to move to LA. And I'm like, well, that's off the table. I'm just, mm. it just wasn't for me. And I'm an East Coast guy and I knew uh, it, was, it was time. So I had a wonderful relationship with the most wonderful guy and we had a great life and I said, I have to go to New York. And he said, I know you do, but I'm not going with you. Mm. So wow. I packed up everything. I sent it to my parents' barn. And then I packed a suitcase and I had $800 in my pocket. And I stayed on a friend's floor in New York. And that was it. Wow. When, what just, year was that? Do you remember? Uh, 95. Wow. Yeah. And in 2001, I did... Catherine Seda Jones and Michael Douglas wedding. Tell me this isn't a wonderful town. Hmm. How did, okay, so, okay. <laughs> That's such a huge job. So how, what Honey, happened? Tell me, tell me about it. <laughs> yes, it really, I was like, oh, um, yeah. I, right after the wedding, I realized uh, that I could go to any airport in the world and find my name in a magazine. Wow. And, and that was three years after I opened my business. That was, and it's, I, I don't know how it happened. I do, was it luck? No, I worked my butt off. I got out there, I knocked on, I worked a little bit for Robert Isabel. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you know that Robert Isabel, Philip Balloon, and Paul Bott all worked for Rennie Reynolds. Have you heard of Rennie Reynolds, uh, who's, uh, whose business no. is now Ren, uh, uh, Rennie and Reed? Okay, uh, yes, I've heard that. New York yes. and, and Miami. His uh, Reed's uncle is Rennie Reynolds, and he basically started special events, like the really big over-the-top events. Actually, uh, the Glorious Food Cookbook features most of his work of those big galas in the 80s when everybody was trying to up one another. And there were three guys working for him. And they also, he had, he would go home at night and they would go to Studio 54 and do all the decor for them. And that was Robert Isabel, Paul Bott, and Philip Balloon. And I got to work for all three of those guys. Mm. So I had a little bit of understanding and I started working for some florist in town. So I got to understand, you know, like the layout of New York and where to deliver flowers here. And one day, uh, two friends of mine just said, you know what? I know you don't have any money. We'll back you to get your stationery and stuff. Why don't you just start your own business? And so I did. And I knocked on every door, every hotel door, every catering manager, everybody in town and said, this is what I want to do. Um, I don't have a big portfolio. I know I can do this if you give me a chance. Amazing. So And, and, <clears throat> and literally ran my business out of my little railroad apartment on 43rd street on the second floor for the like the first year 
I, one night I actually had to sleep under, <laughs> crawl up under a hundred Casablanca lilies. And I thought, if I don't wake up dead tomorrow from the smell, I will be amazed. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody walks in, it's gonna, <laughs> what a picture that would have been to see. Well, yeah. <laughs> well and what, what was great is there was a brothel downstairs that I, you know, at like three in the morning, I have to go, ladies, I know you're having fun, but okay, I'm trying to sleep here. I'm trying to sleep under my Casablanca's. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. I love that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you know, I just, I introduced myself in the flower market. Um, I just got out there and I never stopped and I wrote all my proposals and I did everything and I got up at six o'clock and I, at midnight, I was still writing proposals, you know, That's incredible. and then my friend, Tom Colley, who was, I worked with at Philip Balloon called me one day and said, I found your first employee. I said, I'm not hiring anybody. Said, yes, you are. I'm sending him up right now. And, and I did. And, and so we went from there. Wow. So we, knocking on doors with catering companies, hotels, things like that. Um, did you have the vision then to do weddings and events or were you just open to doing anything and everything? Um, I'm kind of curious, were you that specialized? You knew what you wanted then? No, I had no idea. I, 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 I moved here. I actually, Ian Campbell had said, um, he knew I wanted to be on Broadway. I, my degree is in musical theater. It's in drama. I wanted to be on stage and I got here and I haven't auditioned since I got here. Um, <laughs> But but I knew that I loved to entertain and I knew that I loved hospitality and I I, I think I was kind of destined. I kind of felt destined to do this. I didn't know what it was. I did not move to New York to be a special event designer because right. quite frankly, I didn't know what special events was. Hmm. And I, I, I will tell you frankly, about six months after moving here, I had taken, and here, and here's a little bit of truth. I got a job working as the company manager for New York City Opera. And I took them, I kind of got into New York a little bit. And by that January, I took them back out on the road. I had uh, three buses, two sleeper buses, and or a sleeper bus, three buses, and two tractor trailers on the road for six months. And I came off the road and said, show business is not for me. And New York City Opera said, you know what? You're right, you're fired. Oh, <laughs> it's wow. not for you. Yeah. Uh, and that was an impetus to say, show business is lovely. It's not, it's not my thing. So uh, then I started working in flower shops and I was on this new thing called uh, AOL, mm -hmm. talking to someone about, Tantra and yoga, I don't know what we were talking about. And he said, oh, we're in the same neighborhood. Do you want to catch dinner? And I said, sure. And it was Philip Balloon. Oh. And a week later, I, I said, you know what? I do flowers. I've trained. I didn't know what I was doing. And that, my friend, is what it's all about. I've been in shows going, sure, I can play the guitar. I could not. <laughs> but <laughs> you learn how to do it. And, th and that's, that's, I think, Scott, I, you, you know, if I had said to Philip, no, I really don't know what I'm doing, he wouldn't have hired me. I was his head florist. And he said, I'm going to stick you on this party this weekend and see how you do. And I stepped in and I just kind of guessed at what I was doing. And he called Tom and said, how do you do? And he said he could take my job in a week. So. Wow. You know, so I went from there. I, I don't know whether. Do you know Derek Dematis? No, you know, sir. He's he's a wonderful florist. He lives up in Albany, and he and I were talking about this. And I think flowers kind of have to be in your fingers. You know, you have to 
maybe be able to listen to them. And I think I've always been able to listen to them. Mm. I love that. And, yeah. And, and understand what people see when they see them. Yeah. You know, I remember years ago, this dear, dear client whom I still love and still, this was probably 20 years ago, but her daughter was getting married and I did a big arrangement for her room. And she was like, David, why did you send me dead flowers? I was like, I worked for three hours on that arrangement. It was tulips and I had them, you know, come over and fall over. And, you know, it was like a big wave. Well, I don't understand. Oh, they no. look like they're dead. And I loved it, you know. And, and I think that is part of this business is great. You love it, but you have to produce people are paying and they have to love what they're seeing. Yeah, that's real. That's, that's so true. <clears throat> you know, I, I feel like, um, just hearing you share some of these stories, I, there's so many times where people, um, want to start, they want to, you know, they, they sit there and, and debate, can I do this? Um, uh, you know, they may love flowers. I know I did an interview the other day and they said, you know, there's loving flowers, but there's also falling in love with the business side of it too. And, yeah. and I, and I feel like a lot of times people, you know, this is a phrase that I hear a lot if on other podcasts that are not flower related, but just in general is the idea of imposter syndrome and people you know, not feeling like they not having the confidence or the go get them or whatever. And then it not only affects their, you know, that what is it, that paralysis of um, analysis sort of thing, but yeah. also it affects their pricing and what they charge. And I mean, there's all of that. And, uh, you know, uh, there is, what you think. I, to this day, I suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm. You know, I'm still in my head, David Beam from Lou Ray, Virginia you know, who was the band director and what are you doing paying me $3 million for this wedding? Do you know who I am? You, you know what? But then I have to just shut that off because there is no one who will sabotage you more than yourself. Mm. There is no one out there who you will listen to or take to heart more than your inner voice. And if you can just shut that off, I, you know, if I had listened to that voice of you don't know what you're doing, I wouldn't be here today. Mm. You know, you just gotta just try it. There was a, a Flintstones episode. I would, I, maybe I should try to find it where uh, Fred and Barney and Wilma and, and, uh, Ed. Betty, 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 <laughs> we're at a party and everybody was jumping into the pool and Fred couldn't swim and he was weird. And the lifeguard just came up and picked him up by the back of the thing and by the tail of his loincloth and said, <laughs> everyone into the pool Boom, and threw him in and he swam, you know, and I, I have lived my life with everyone into the pool. Let's see what happens. Mm. Uh, and it's, it has served me well because my inner voice and my self doubt is so strong. I can't sleep at night that I, I worry about not being good enough. And, you know, I think thankfully a lot of this stuff, Scott, I never looked at any flower books. I never looked at anything. So I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm, yeah. And just kind of created, I, I had the basics from FTD, how to wire, you know, chicken wire here, here. This is Oasis. This is how you cut a flower. I knew all of that, but everything else I had to experiment with, especially physics, because <laughs> <laughs> physics is not something you want to argue with <laughs> when you have 3000 pound branches in the air. You, that's when the science has to come in, but experimenting and and just doing it oh i was on a good train and now i don't know where it was but um 
I think it is very important to do it, to try it. And it's also very important to go, this ain't working. Mm. You know, me keeping books? No. <laughs> you know, I tried this. There was a new thing called QuickBooks, and I downloaded it onto that little square Mac computer that, you know, that all of us had. And I, I had that, the book so messed up in about five minutes. It was just, it's know what you do well and know what you don't do well and don't do what you don't do well. Mm. Like uh, I, I, I would have been a magnificent conductor. I know from my band director days, I know how to get emotion out of people. I don't have the mathematical mind and a good conductor needs to be able to transpose and do a lot of the mathematical part of music. And I know that I didn't do that, so I didn't pursue it. But I knew I had flowers in my fingers and I knew that people listened to me and I know that I have leadership qualities that make people want to follow. So I guess I kind of combined all of that. And that this is what happened. <laughs> I, um, I think, uh, uh, but, but the self doubt is so strong to this day. Oh, I know what I was going to say. When you go to um, a co convention, like uh, the engage summit mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> is all planners and florists and designers and, uh, um, the first time I came back, I was just, I listened to everybody and go, well, why does he have that client? Why does she have that client? Oh my God. And Christina, my number two, who has been working with me now for 21 years, when I went to the second engage, she said, do not go there and come back crazy again, or you're not going back. <laughs> so what, what does that mean? Cra crazy how? Well, you get jealous. Like, why does he have that business? Why does, you know, lots of times it's just people talking and try and puffing themselves up. Right. You know, people, whether they mean to or not, emphasize and lie about where they are on the path. You know, they're, that company isn't making $14 million a year, but he's saying he is and set, trying to, put itself up on a pedestal. That company d does more than eight weddings a year, but they're trying to be exclusive, you know? Right. And I started listening to that instead of just shutting up and staying in my own lane and l not listening to anybody and not listening to the inner voice, but doing what I knew had to be done. Well, you've touched on a couple things that I, would <clears throat> like to unpack just a little bit. Um, one, I, I don't, uh, both of them, I'm not sure they're kind of was in my list that we talked about or I sent you earlier. But one is you, you mentioned, um, you know, knowing what you're not good at and bringing that person in to do that for you. Um, Oh and... my gosh, the guy, yeah, the guy who sits on the other side of this wall is the reason I have a business. And my staff is the reason. My staff tells me what to charge because I would give away the farm. Okay. So how do you go about hiring employees? How do you find those people that you know are a good fit for you? Um, you let them do I, it? <laughs> no, you know, I, I yeah. But I, I hire people and say, you're here for six months. And at six months, we're going to sit down. And if it's not working, you're going. Okay. Uh, 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 Shark Tank, Bar Barbara Corcoran mm -hmm. has a theory, shoot the dogs early. And when she hires you, you have, I think it's three months to make a million dollars in sales. And if you don't, you have to go. There's no question. It doesn't matter how much they like you. It doesn't matter how cute you are nothing. If you don't make that million dollars in sales, you have to go because you're not right for the company. And uh, I've, I've let lots of people go. 
because it's not right. And why, you know, I, I can't remember his name. Uh, don't get old. All the names and faces <laughs> just go away. But <laughs> this, this guy who was talking about the eighth place ribbon, how giving everybody an award and everybody a ribbon really kind of messed with everybody's brain. Yeah. Because uh, you're, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. Uh, my staff is sort of agog, like when we'll lose a big, you know, like a, a million dollar wedding, I'm like, it wasn't ours. Mm. And why, why get worked up and spend all that energy when it wasn't yours? And you'll find out later exactly why it was. You'll find out later it was a nightmare for <laughs> the person who got it. <laughs> you know, and it and it was the universe looking after you. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, Interesting how that can happen. Yeah, but no, I know that I would give away everything, and I, my inner voice goes, "Oh, we can't charge that." So literally, I design it, and Ryan Zoller, my creative director, decides how much to charge for it, and I never see the invoice because I would pass out. Hmm. That's interesting. We're charging, we're charging what, you know, now this guy sitting over here every month, we pull out every number and in front of everybody goes, why is this so low in this percentage? What happened on this party? Why did we only make X number of percent on this? You know, so you have to be accountable. And there are times when we go, let's let's shoot under this to get this and get this in our portfolio. Right. You know? But we do it consciously. But right. everybody everybody <laughs> here controls everything that goes outdoor. I look at everything. Um I say I don't look at the numbers. Of course I look at the numbers, but I I try not to argue with the numbers because mm -hmm my producers understand what it takes what it costs and my warehouse and my uh production managers understand the labor of what it's going to take in combination with everything sure to move this can from point a to point b just takes one person but it's a thousand of those cans that need to be moved in a half an hour mm, right and, and just be I, I'm very fortunate to have be surrounded by people who have the ability to back up and look at, you know, Todd Fisk has said one day, and I, I don't know the answer to this right now, and shame on me. Todd Fisk has said, do you know how much a, a block of Oasis cost? And I did not. And when I found out, I was shocked, you know. You don't think about that. You're just like, oh, put 10 blocks of Oasis in that big arrangement. Well, did you charge for it? Yeah. Did you make a, did you make a profit on it? Ed Libby says, this is a business, not some wonderful hobby. And a lot of people treat it as a hobby, but the gas, the, the car doesn't run without gasoline. And if you're not able you know, when the pandemic hit, I was able to keep everybody employed. That's amazing. I, you know, I. Especially in New York. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because my, none of my landlords would give me a break. We gave, uh, they gave me uh, uh, an abatement. Uh, what's the word? Nothing. We could, we could pay down the road. But mm -hmm. we still had to pay. No, I, we have three landlords because we have the office and two warehouses. And, you know, the landlords in New York in particular got hit because they had a lot of people just up and leave. And I knew what was coming this past year when we were finally able to come out that it was going to be wild. And sure. I needed to keep everybody on staff to so that i'd have people to turn to and we were still absolutely overwhelmed 
because you know we had uh, in the before times like <laughs> someone called it uh, <laughs> we had a slew of these lovely wonderful little thai ladies that would sit around and do all these things and when the pandemic started to hit everybody got on a plane and left and nobody's come back mm. and so it's been quite the challenge i i you know i'm flying pe- freelancers in from hawaii that's not a great deal mm. you know that that hurts but once you sell the party you have to come through you're only as good as your last party and you have to come through mm. and but and, and i say all that and like that we always meet our profit margin we don't always meet that in 2008 um when tech stocks crashed and i was doing uh, the wedding of the son of a guy who is basically on the board of the world <laughs> just said ken i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna close it down because this is just is it making sense there's not money coming in and i'm i don't know what to do and he said i'm gonna be in your neighborhood i'm gonna come look at your books and he looked at the books for three minutes and said shut up you're making profit on the stuff that you're making just say yes to everything get money moving through your business and you're going to be fine and i'm still sitting here that's awesome looking a little worse for wear i tell you what <laughs> this, I, i'm gonna to have to do the the go back to the botox guy this <laughs> pandemic has really kind of done it in i i'm looking at myself on the screen going oh Honey, what the hell happened? <laughs> well, the stress of a pandemic followed by record-breaking wedding numbers probably for right afterwards. Well, and, you know, and there for a while, I don't think it's happening, certainly not happening the way it was. Um, right out of the pandemic, everybody was saying yes to everything. You know, never had... You know, we always say here, this meets your budget. If you want to add on some things, here's some creative options that we can, you can think about. You, no one will miss them. You can add them on. Right after the pandemic, everybody was taking all the options. Oh, wow. It, 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 I had never seen anything like it. And then suddenly we had to, as you know, produce things where there wasn't any material. We had chairs made for a big wedding in Aspen we had them made in China and we gave the order six months ahead of time and during the wedding they were sitting on a boat in Long Beach Harbor mm. I had 700 chairs sitting there wow yeah I mean it, it's wow. definitely a new a new age for all of that yeah um, um, it, it's a new age but at the same time you have to make sure you're making money on it like Right. I, I, I never would have thought we had big, um, I don't know if you saw that wedding we did in Philadelphia with all the big silver orbs everywhere. Yes, we had, I did. We, yes. we had to have those made because I wanted them brand new. You can rent them, but I wanted these brand new. So we had them made and shipped. And two years before that, it would have been a $5,000 shipping fee. It was $22,000 to ship them. And you know, somebody's yes. got to pay for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people don't realize that. And they want to know, you know, I, I don't know who I was talking with recently, but we were talking, you know, a, a container that shipped from uh, China now. It used to be like $3,000, and now it's like $30,000. And that's yeah. and that's probably old. That's probably more than that now, but yeah. unless it's tapering off some. But, yeah, it's crazy. I will say, I, you know, we do a lot of holiday stuff uh, for the Durst organization here. We do like 17 buildings. And we had a piece damaged recently. And my guy, the, the manufacturer, came to look at the damage. And I was like, okay, so when can I order this to get the new piece? He was, and this was last week. And he said, I think you've probably missed the deadline. For holiday, wow. for custom, yeah. He said, "We'll try, but I don't know that I can get it to you from China." 
mm. by then. You know, be, one, their factories are shut down or shutting down and they don't have raw material. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely I, felt I, everywhere. I, I don't mean to be Mr. Doom and Gloom because it's not. You know, if any business can make make it work, we can. <laughs> we know how to do it. But, you know, and I think it's just thinking ahead. When the pandemic was coming down, I said, I don't want to spend the money, but we really should because when we come out of this, I didn't know it was going to be here. But I said, when we come out of this, we're going to be really pressed. And I had, was talking to the people in Holland, and I knew there weren't flowers being planted. So we went out to Lark Silk out in New Jersey and bought every white flower they had to have in stock so that we could have something. And I think that's what this business is about, is just backing it up. How do we do this? And then how are you going to make it work? Because nobody uh, wants to hear no. Right. That's exactly true. So that makes me think about when you sell an event, you know, so many times I feel like designers or planners, you know, depending on where they are in, in the process, um, put themselves in a difficult place by selling something very, very specific then then when that doesn't happen and you have to kind of zig or zag, um, I'm just curious, you know, when you are planning and designing an event, do how do you go about that to maybe give yourself the leeway and flexibility to allow the creative process to happen if something like like something like your chairs end up, you know, missing the the event? We we have uh clauses in our contract that says we'll do our absolute damnness to get this here. Mm -hmm. If we can't, we will let you know, and then you will, you will have the power. It will not be held against you. You will have the power to decide what that change is. But um, uh, down to, and I can't remember exactly how it's worded in the contract, but it's if the price of flowers goes sky high, we mm -hmm. will call you and give you the chance to raise that to keep the same stem count, or we will reduce the stem count and you will have the same flowers, but it will be a different arrangement. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, so it, it's just about covering your your butt. Yeah, because you you just simply don't know. Yeah, well, no I think that's knows. smart. No, yeah, no one knows. Mm. I, <laughs> And I, and I think we're just all going to have to continue to keep looking behind us and, <laughs> and looking forward at the same time. Yeah. You know, I had a, a, a life coach one time who said, you, you're driving your life's car and you can choose to look through the windshield or you can choose to look in the rear view mirror. Mm. Which is the safest way to drive. <laughs> But that's so true. What is the safest yeah. way to drive? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So it just you just got to keep looking forward. Don't look back unless you want to go that way. And ever, ever forward, ever plowing through the muck, and now ever plowing through the muck upstairs. Because mm. you... People are going to understand if you say, no, they, <laughs> sometimes they do not understand. But if, if you say the flowers simply aren't there, what can we do to make this work for you? Here are some options. Yeah. And, and remind them that nobody's going to know except for them. Right. That's so true. It, 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 that's really important. It, unless you tell everybody, if you go, oh my God, that was supposed to be pink and now it's blush, no one would know. Yeah. Because it's still gorgeous. Yeah. And no one is thinking yeah, that's, anything bad. No, and that's... It, I, I said to one lady, I'm like, we're alive. 
we're outside. You have a bride, a groom, you have a rabbi. What else do you want? Everything else is fluff. I know you want more fluff than we're going to be able to give you, but it's not here. And you got love and you got pretty. And you're here. So can we move forward now? And what did they say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it, sometimes I know it's about perspective. Um, speaking of that, I something you said earlier, um, and I'm not exactly sure where you said it in our conversation. I don't know if it was when we were talking about <laughs> the opera, you know, <laughs> opera on the road situation or or your early days, but this I you know, that you were good at um creating or understanding the need to create emotion. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes without that an event is very flat or two dimensional. And it's like, that is, that's a real superpower. I think. Um, is it a superpower or is it something you just have to think about? You have to stop. What mm. are the points in this evening that are going to, a party never goes on a straight line. If it does, it's flat, it's boring. And what's the use? Why bother? Mm. You know, if you're going to bring people, I'm a, you know, if you're going to bring people into a ballroom, here's a glass of wine, sit down, here's some food, listen to what we have to say, and go home. What is memorable? Why would I want to go to that? What? And I think maybe that's the big question. Why would I want to come to this event? What am I? And, and it's a very important question that I especially ask brides. If the first thing I asked was, People are leaving your party. What do you want them to say? And that will be really telling about, you know, was it the best party or what an elegant evening? That will really help you back into it. But I, I think of, you know, life's a roller coaster. A, an event should be a, a roller coaster. Not quite sure what's going to come around the next curve, <laughs> but what can you throw at people that they don't see coming? You know, one of the most delightful things that I, I still remember it and I loved it. We were uh, at Engage at the Breakers and it was the first time they had done this. It was a um, first like a amuse-bouche and suddenly you saw this parade of waiters coming out and everyone got their own individual hand carved ice raw bar. It was a, a carved ice on a plate that was a raw bar. Wow. Everyone in that room got their own. And you, I will never forget that. That was probably 15 years ago. I'm just like, bravo, you really took this sit down dinner and slapped it around. You know, because people got involved. Just, you did this for me? Mm, wow. Yeah. And I think that that's most important and, and that I sometimes have a hard time telling brides is that, yeah, it's your day, but you have people dropping their lives to come to your wedding. What are you going to do for them? Mm. You know, I, someone gives $100,000. Are you going to give them a piece of rubber chicken and say, thank you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's probably the last time you got a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. How I guess I'm trying to think, you know, a lot of times people that don't operate at that level, that don't have that experience, um, I, I often kind of think, you know, where do people or where do you where where do you find and this sounds like such a cliche question and I I always hate asking it, but for you, I, I feel I, I'm going to give myself a pass. Um, where do you find the inspiration for that kind of stuff? Because, you know, it's like it's especially someone that operates at your level. You're always trying to do the new thing. Yeah. It, uh, look, 
there's a reason I don't have hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I worry about it. Oh my God, I'm you know now I was David Bean. Now I'm David Bean. <laughs> you know, and people have expectations that are sometimes unrealistic. But I also surround myself with good people, and I spend a lot of time just looking like um, I took my whole staff uh, they worked so hard during 2021 uh, that we all went to Maison of Jay uh, I took everybody to Paris and then I just said let's just enjoy Paris let's go to dinner let's let's go over here let's go to the uh, uh, to a museum or everybody just go and do what they want and find inspiration wherever you want and like we went to the Maison and Objet show and I asked everybody to take pictures of what they found inspiring and what what they like. And so we spent three hours just last week going through everybody's pictures mm. and, and talking about what we liked and what we saw and look at this structure, not basically, you know, we were looking more at the show than the product because we know where to get the product but how was it displayed you know how how was it interesting and and what caught your eye because it just you know scott i i'm a big proponent is if you take a blank room and you put one rose in it you have changed that room mm. massively you have really changed that room but if you put a thousand roses in it, how you present it will change that room or overwhelm it and not say what you want it to say. So I, I think it's about looking at art and how, you know, and nobody does presentation and visual emotion better than the French. Mm. And, and so I, I the staff came over and then I stayed another week and just basically walked around Paris all week. I didn't even go to the Louvre. I, I, I just walked and looked, looked at displays, went into stores and just, you know, I, <laughs> years ago, I, I was doing the New York Hall of Science, uh, their first gala and they probably had like $40 a table. And I had seen an art installation in Paris just a few weeks before that was nothing but uh, water glasses with colored water in them with okay. candles sitting amongst them. And I did that and you would have thought, oh my God, wow. Because, you know, all the glasses were able to be put on the rental bill. We took a thing and we took some candles and suddenly there was a science experiment of refraction. So they had a scientist stand up and talk about the centerpiece and how refraction was happening and what the, how that happens in their life. And boom, and it cost them no money. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, but that's what it takes. Amazing. No, but, but no, but I'm just saying though, <laughs> it is that you came up with an idea for forty bucks a table. But I'm I guess I'm saying, you know, yeah, that please you... don't tell anybody <laughs> that I ever did that. <laughs> It'll be our secret. So <laughs> but it's um finding those that inspiration though and getting out, and I think that's one thing that sometimes people don't invest in themselves, is the idea of you know, going to places and, and, and unplugging maybe, and just like you said, just walking the streets and seeing things and, uh, and, and experiencing but, and travel. stuff. Yes. Travel, 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 travel. I, and that's, I think that's my most important thing is that I love to travel and to get out there. And, you know, because we, we started David Beam Destinations because Christina and I both want loved to travel and let's take it on the road and sure. because of that uh we were among the first ones to really kind of go planners do you know what this hotel looks like and so we started doing fan trips back way back when 
and you know getting people to sponsor to bring people in to see their hotel and to experience it mm. because i can show you all the pictures in the world but until you are sitting at monteverdi tuscany at breakfast looking over the val d'orcia you don't get it right yeah a thousand percent agree yes but if you're sitting there and you taste that yogurt that's made by that woman who lives right down the hill and smelling that air and watching the bees on the lavender and having the breeze and looking at the sun come up over the Val of Georgia, you know, you can't put that in a picture. You can put it in an experience yeah, and you can sell it. You can sell it and you can make money from it. Well, that's amazing. I um, want to get a plane ticket right now. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually, before I signed on, I, I think I'm going to take Maddie and I to Ischia, the, a little island like right near Capri that not a whole lot of people go to. And I think I'm just going to go and disappear. Um, that's a great idea. And, and look at the, oh, look at the color of the water how inspiring yay yeah yes absolutely <laughs> um with everything that's been going on i'm i'm kind of curious do you ever and of course your your traveling may be the answer um do you ever feel like you need you're getting to a point where you're where burnout is a possible possibility for you or uh, I, oh i i would be lying to say that i haven't just like almost banging my head on the wall recently because mm -hmm. you know be, be, between covid and people getting sick and wondering and worrying and where's the money coming from and where's the business coming from and can will we be able to do this party and if we can have people there will we have product yeah uh, and you know and covid changed people I'm not sure it changed for the better. Uh, you know, everybody's more on edge. Everybody's a little bit more unpleasant. And it doesn't make our business any easier. Mm. But every time I think, you know, and I'm 62, I'm tired. I'm old. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be 62 this year. I don't know how that happens. Uh, but what else would I do? And and I have one of the best jobs in the world. Yeah. My job is to make people happy and to help them celebrate. Oh. What else would I do besides yeah. disappear onto the, into a little <laughs> farm, which, which will eventually happen. One day, I really am just going to go, okay, thank you. I, it, it was been lovely. I'm going to go plant petunias. There you go. Well, one of the things I, I will say that um, I know during the pandemic, um, I was already following you on Instagram, but it was, I really enjoyed, um, I, I don't know, well, how did it, how to describe your chats you would do on, on Instagram as a live? Um, I don't know if, if inspiration, uh, perspective, uh brief moments of sanity <laughs> no, i don't know about i don't know about sanity but yeah I, I don't know i don't know why i did that scott but i you know the day that the world started shutting down i had been in i had gone to thailand two weeks ahead of that for easton and we did the wedding on a Saturday. We had to fly out early Sunday morning. And we went from uh, Phuket, Chiang Mai, Bangkok to uh, Hong Kong. And we got off the plane and came into customs in Hong Kong. And there was nobody there on a Sunday in oh, Hong wow. Kong. And I went, here we go. So I guess I, two weeks ahead of time, I knew what was 
coming down. Right. And so when it happened, everybody, I, my phone was just like, what are we going to do? And, uh, what it? and so I handed the phone to Katie, who was standing right here. And I said, record this for me. And I just said, everybody take a deep breath. We're going to be okay. Mm. And the, the, the response I got from that let me know that I had to continue it. And, um, and then I, I did it until it just, it, it wore me out because I'd, sure. I'd have to get up early because at the farm. And the reason I gave up the farm was it's an 1813 farmhouse. It sat right on the road. So while <laughs> the back of the house was peaceful, I could still hear, hear cars and still be reminded that the world was there. So, um, I'm looking for a place that I can go to not hear the world. But um, but but I'd have to get up at 6 a.m. before all the, the traffic would start. So to record in between cars going by and and then come up with something new and inspirational every morning was like when I was dealing with the pandemic myself and watching my my needle go from full to empty. Yeah. It, it it took its toll. I yeah. I probably will be doing it again. I didn't realize that people were seeing it. I think people would watch it and not hit like. So I was, and I didn't know to look at the views, but um, I've been very humbled by the number of people who said they heard it. So yeah, that was yeah. really cool. It was pretty, it was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> As always, I feel like <clears throat> you've given so many great ideas and pieces of advice, but I always like to ask that final advice question, kind of like what somebody, I don't know, something that might be on your heart to share, but something that maybe, you know, it could be for a new business person. It could be for someone learning how to grow their business. I, I don't know. I don't know what piece of advice you'd like to share, but if there's something, I, I, yeah, I think it was just what I was talking about earlier. Shut up, hmm. shut up, and just get into the pool and swim. And if you don't like it, you can turn. You know, your your feet can still touch the bottom, and you can figure out how to get back to the other side before before you get too deep. But my my mentor, Chris Mann, who uh, was the executive stage manager of the Metropolitan Opera for thirty years sort of like saw me when I was starting at the opera and just kind of went, oh God, who is this redneck kid here? Let me pluck him out and, and <laughs> take care of him. And, you know, he knew I had no money and he would take me out to dinner and just, we'd just sit and talk. And, and he was just a wonderful mentor in my life. So I, one, be a mentor, find mm -hmm. someone and, and mentor them through. But two, when I decided that I was going to leave Bobby and leave San Diego and pick up and go to this monolith called <laughs> New York, I started getting cold feet. And one day I, I know where I was standing in the opera offices. And he just said, shut up. If you have to go to McDonald's and flip hamburgers for a little while, while you get on your feet, you'll flip hamburgers, but you're going to do fine. But unless you go do it, you're not going to do it. Mm. And I think that's the advice. Shut I up. I love that. <laughs> do it. I love that. And, and, and get, and get your head out of the way. Yeah. Stop thinking about it. Yeah. Don't, there it is. Don't think about it. Do it. There you go. That's there's what a, it is. There's a, there's a t-shirt there. So I love that. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for um, sharing. And uh, I, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Well, it's my sincere pleasure. I hope I didn't talk too much and hope I didn't get too crazy. But... <laughs> you were great. <laughs>